Father, we thank you this morning. Father, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to stand before your people to speak a word from your heart. Father, I, I welcome the ministering gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence in this place. We invite you in. We ask that you would have your way in this place. That you would minister to every heart listening to this message this morning. And that something will be said that will penetrate the innermost being of the people of God this morning. Allow them to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying this morning. And it is our prayer that, that no one is allowed to exit this facility untouched. You know what they need. You know their petitions. You know their desires, you know their fears, you know their worries. So do what only you can do. Touch, deliver, save, set free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Lamentations chapter 3, beginning with verse 22, the text says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 23, the text says, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The reason his mercy is new every morning is because yesterday's mercy removed all and I mean all record of all wrong of yesterday. Whatever we did yesterday, that's been cleansed, wiped away because of the mercies of God. God does not hold our mistakes over our head like people do. He is a gracious God. He is a God of compassion. And he will not hold us in a place whereby we cannot move forward because of our mistakes. This morning, I thought I was going to move on uh, to another series, but the Lord wants me to, to touch on this subject. This is not a new subject. It's not anything you have not heard. It's not anything that is uh, of, of deep substance. It's very simple, but yet powerful and will set you free if you embrace it in a manner in which the Lord gives it to us. This morning, I'm going to talk about forgiving and being healed. Forgiving and being healed. If you're going to have a meaningful relationship with anybody for any extended period of time, you have to learn how to forgive. Amen. Forgiveness is the key to a duration of a relationship. If you're going to have a relationship that's going to last, that's going to uh, withstand the test of, of, of trials and challenges. It has to be a relationship whereby you recognize that you have to forgive people of their mistakes. Amen, Lord. Whether it's between you and your spouse, or you are an ex-spouse, you are a, a, a sister or a brother, or someone in the church, or someone at your job, 
whether it's your neighbor, whether it's um, uh, uh, a coworker, you have to come to that place where you recognize that, you know what, regardless of what has happened in this relationship, I will not allow the, the wrong to um, destroy the good of that relationship. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Forgiveness is key to a long-lasting relationship, especially if you're married. They asked um, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, they were married for years, I think 50 plus years, and the question was asked, what was the key to their long lasting marriage? And she responded very simply by saying, Billy and I are forgivers. And what she was saying was, he has learned to forgive me and I have learned to forgive him regardless of what we come up against. Amen, Amen somebody. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, around about verse 17, I think it is, that faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, oftentimes we hear messages on forgiveness and we know about forgiveness and we know what the text says about forgiveness, but we don't have faith to operate in forgiveness because we don't hear it as often as we should. What's important to understand is that if you and I are going to have a relationship with God whereby we can understand his, uh, his total capacity to be able to uh, forgive us by his love, then we have to learn how to forgive others. There's no way for us to really truly understand how God can really forgive us if we don't operate in that same um, uh, standard of forgiveness. We serve a God that is full of compassion, full of mercy, and a love that is unconditional. And in order for us to understand that unconditional love, we have to be able to come to that place where we try to operate the way he operates. Let me understand what I'm saying this morning. And he is a God that says, you know what, regardless, Doug, of what you did yesterday, if you come to me and ask for forgiveness, forgiveness is there for you to receive. Amen. And tomorrow, I'm not going to deal with you based on what happened yesterday. Tomorrow, we start a new slate. We start a new record. Come on, somebody. And so God, he, he ministers to us and he deals with us with the understanding that we are in covenant and we start fresh anew every morning. God, I love that about God. Now, you know, folks don't, they don't operate that way. Some folks. You mess up, you step on somebody's toes today and 20 years from now, they're going to let you know, you stepped on my toe in 2022. You stepped on my toe. But we got to come to that place where we recognize that we wanna, if we're really going to grow in God, that we have to operate the way he operates, especially in relationships where we come to that place where we release people from their transgressions towards us. You know, um, when I was working with the Department of Defense, um, I was a, a contract negotiator. I think Bernice might be able to appreciate, appreciate this because she was in contracts, I believe, right? Um, we would uh, put the contracts together. And before we would sign those contracts, before I could put my name on the, on the contract as a warranted contracting officer, I had to submit that contract to our legal department. And the legal department wanted to make sure that there were clauses in that contract, what they call um, uh, release clauses. And these clauses now are placed in the contract and they are designed to foresee and to deal with any type of issue that may arise after the contract is executed. 
So what they're doing is they are placing clauses in the contract in anticipation that there might be a disagreement as you're working on the contract. And so what they do is to make sure that there are clauses in the contract so you can go ahead and deal with the problem before the problem happens. I mean, I'll say what I'm saying. Now, if it doesn't happen, fine. But we're not going to pretend like there's not going to be a problem. We're going to deal with anticipated problems up front before we sign this contract. So if by chance we bump heads, this thing's already dealt with. It's the same thing in relationships. Your, your release clause is the clause of forgiveness. So we're going to enter into this relationship with full understanding that there is a possibility that we might bump heads. But if by chance we do bump heads, we've already taken care of the problem, regardless of what the problem is, because the release clause is the clause that says, I forgive you. When I enter into a covenant with my wife, I've already, I already embraced that release clause, knowing that at some point, at some time, I was going to upset her. Amen, somebody. Amen. But I knew that regardless, I was going to forgive and keep moving. Amen. I'm sorry. What you sorry for? I don't know. Let's keep it moving. Amen. And she learned that about me. After a while, she picked up on it. She's like, don't, you know, what you sorry for? I don't, you know, I'm sorry. My point was, we're going to keep this moving. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. The text says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Verse 32, the text says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he penned this epistle, he's talking to the church. And in verse 31, he lists about six things that he instructs the church to get rid of when it comes to their relationship with each other. He says, get rid of bitterness. What is bitterness? Bitterness is pent up resentment whereby you could actually hurt someone if you're not careful. Bitterness is a root. The Bible talks about be, be, be aware of the root of bitterness. Bitterness happens because you, you, you have been hurt and you have been nursing that hurt for so long that that thing has set up in your spirit as a root. And it becomes resentment. And if you're not careful, if the right button is punched, you can lash out. This is why Cain killed Abel. Because of resentment. Then he says, rage. He says, get rid of rage. Now, what is rage? Rage is where you, you go off. You have this uncontrolled anger. And something is said or something is done. And someone pushes the wrong button. And you have this explosion of anger whereby you just you just start saying things that you would not normally say in your little Christian everyday activity <laughs> you start breaking stuff that you would not normally break because you paid good money for it but you have flew off in this this fit this rage because you have this uncontrolled anger See, that's why forgiveness is important because if you try to sweep it under the rug as if nothing has happened, it doesn't go away. Those issues don't resolve themselves. You have to resolve issues. 
especially if there are issues that are eating at you. But he says, get rid of bitterness, get rid of rage. He says, anger. What is anger? Anger is an attitude of retaliation. Revenge. When well, you're just thinking about what you're going to do to them the next time you see them. Now, I might have been the only one who's ever experienced that. I don't know. But I've been there. I've been there with my Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking self. Well, I thought to myself, Pastor Jackson, they ought to be glad they're not here today. <laughs> what was going on? My attitude was wrong. I had anger. Then he says, harsh words. Get rid of harsh words. What are harsh words? Harsh words are threatenings. Words of intimidation. Abusive words. Words that say, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, mm, I'm, mm. I am going to, I'm, mm. My mother, I don't know why I tell you about my mother. She would get, when we was growing up, she'd get so mad at us. Because she never did it, but she'd get so mad at us. She'd go from, if you don't stop, I'm going to pick a beat off your head. You don't know what that means, right? I uh, know. But then when she gets really angry, she would say, or she would say I'm going to drive your head right through that wall. What was she doing? She was threatening. And when she went from picking a beat off your head to putting your head through the wall, that's when you know you stop. Just in case she couldn't control herself. But thank God she never did. Harsh words. He says, get rid of slander. Slander is words of defamation, belittling people, backbiting, disparaging someone's reputation, scandalize someone's name. I'm going to tell everybody about you. I'm going to tell everybody what you did. I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that you are a blankly blank blank. Harsh words, slander. Then he says, all types of evil behavior. What is evil behavior? Evil behavior is behavior that's not Christ-like. Paul says, get rid of all of this. Then he says in verse 32, he says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Now, Paul makes it sound easy. But how many know it's not easy? Paul makes it sound as if it's just something you can just, you just do it. Because he said do it. But it's not that easy. You have to have your flesh under control of the Holy Spirit. Well, you recognize that you know what? This is how I'm going to conduct myself, whether my flesh feels like it or not. Amen, somebody. And I do this because I know that it's pleasing to God. And I do this because I know that there's a benefit in it for me. Amen, somebody. The Greek word for forgive is apolos. It's spelled A-P-O-L-U-O. And it means to release. It means to release. Release from payment. It means to cease from resentment. It means not to keep score. It means to clear the record. So forgiveness is a decision now that you and I make to release someone payment of their wrong towards us. See, that's the, that's, the, that's the whole thing. When someone wrongs us or someone hurts us, we want them to pay 
for the wrong that they have caused us. Is that right? In other words, they hurt me, and so I want to make sure that they pay for that hurt, or at least they hurt as bad as they hurt me. See, y'all, y'all, y'all not being honest with me this morning. Y'all looking at me, but some of you this morning, right now, this year, have been dealing with this issue. Amen, somebody. Because you have come into some type of disagreement with someone and you felt or you feel as if you have been wronged and you want them to pay for the wrong that you believe that you have encountered. And so now you're sitting on top of that issue. You're dealing with that issue this morning. And every time their name comes up, something turns inside of you. Every time you see them, something turns inside of you. What's going on? You still have this unresolved issue between you and that person that you feel you have been wronged and you want some type of payment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're talking about relationships. I got, you know, it's just one of those things you got to talk about. Isn't that right? But forgiveness now releases that person from that wrong. I don't forgive you for you. I forgive you so I can be free of you. I don't want to be tied to you based on that encounter. I will deal with you, but I'm not going to deal with you based on that encounter. I'm going to let that go. Amen, somebody. And that's what forgiveness does. It causes us now to be free from that encounter that hurt us. Now, what does the Bible say about forgiveness? The Bible says a lot about forgiveness. A lot about forgiveness. I'm just going to touch on a few things here this morning. One of the things the Bible says about forgiveness is the fact that when we don't forgive, when we choose not to release a person for payment of their wrong that they have committed towards us, we are held captive by the pain that they have caused us. We are held captive by the pain that they caused us. John 20, verse 23, Jesus says, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now watch what the message translation says. The message translation says for John 20 verse 23, if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, I love this, what are you going to do with them? If you forgive them, they're gone for good. But if you don't forgive them, what are you going to do with them? In other words, if someone hurts me and I don't release them for, from hurting me or release them from, from wanting to get payment from hurting me, then what am I going to do with that hurt they caused me? Well, I'm going to sit on it. I'm going to meditate on it and I'm going to allow it to eat me alive day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out, year after year, after year, after year, after year, century after century. Because I held on to it. I 
held it. And Jesus, what are you going to do with it? If you don't let it go, what are you going to do with it? You're going to nurse it. You're going to nurse the pain. You're going to nurse the hurt. And every chance you get, you're going to tell somebody what happened. This is what they did. This is how they wronged me. This is how it went down. But the problem is, every time you tell the story, it's like you're punching yourself in the gut every time the, toys, the story's told because you feel that pain all over again. If you don't let it go, you're going to relive it. And relive it. This is one of the reasons why they believe that second marriages in terms of divorce rate are higher than first marriages. They say that the divorce rate for a second marriage is much higher than the divorce rate of the first marriage. And the reason they believe it is, is because what happened in the first marriage was never resolved and the person or the persons who were hurt bring it into the second marriage and reflect or reject the pain on the second person that was caused by the first person. Jesus says in Luke chapter 17 verse 3, Jesus says, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Jesus says in essence here in verse 3, he says, when something is wrong, confront it. If someone has hurt you, confront it. Why? Because you can't get free of it until you deal with it. So forgiveness is about regaining control of your life. Some of us this morning really need to think about regaining control of our lives, our emotional lives. He says in verse 4, he says, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Jesus told his disciples, he said, now, if, if that same person was to come to you seven times in one day and ask for forgiveness, he said, you forgive him. Another translation says 70 times seven. Jesus, how often should we forgive this guy? And I, he's probably thinking, well, Jesus is going to say, man, this couple of times, you're good. He said, no, 70 times 7. What was he saying? And as he was saying that you were, or we are to forgive or release people from their wrong. Come on, give God a praise. <laughs> the second thing that the Bible says about us releasing people that hurt us in relationships, he says, or the Bible says in Psalms 32 verse 3, NIV translation, this is David now. David says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. What David was saying was, when I kept stuff to myself, he says, my bones aged. My bones wasted away. What the text is saying in essence is that when we don't forgive people, it affects our health. Some folks, they believe, have cancer and cancer's eating them up because they're holding all this unforgiveness. Now, I don't, you know, I, I can't prove that. I'm just telling you about what they say. Well, of course, you know, cancer is caused by everything now. You know, you blink wrong. But what David is saying here is that when I keep silent, 
my bones wasted away. In other words, when I keep stuff in, when I hold stuff in, because I don't want to deal with it, I just, you don't worry about it, I'm good. No, you're not good. Your bones are older than you are physically. You can feel it in your bones. You can feel that depression in your bones, that, 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 that anger in your bones, that, that rage deep down in your spirit. You can feel it. You're a walking time bomb. Amen, somebody. When you refuse to talk to people who have wronged you, who have hurt you, you cause issues with your physical body. Amen, somebody. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, the text says, A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. That text is saying, in essence, that when you are able to hear good news, it ministers to your soul. Like medicine ministers to your physical body. He says, but when you don't hear good news, he says, it's, it, it breaks your spirit. It wounds you. A wounded spirit becomes a closed spirit. And when you close your spirit, you not only close your spirit to other people, you close your spirit to God. And when your spirit is closed, God can't get nothing to you. But we close it because we think, well, I don't want, no one else is going to treat me or hurt me like this again. I'm never going to be hurt like this again. So we close our spirit. But the thing is, when you close up, you put yourself in this invisible prison. So emotionally, ain't nobody behind that, door, that, that, that bar or that door but you. And God has said, I'm, I'm trying to get some stuff to you. I'm trying to bless you. But your spirit is closed. Because you've been hurt. Amen, somebody. Second, or the third reason is this. And that's the, the great Romans 8.28 We forgive because we know that somehow, some way, I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he would do it. But somehow, some way, we know that God is going to cause what happened to us to work to our good. Amen, somebody. There's a greater purpose that God has in allowing whatever happened to happen. Amen. The challenge that we have is that when we have disagreements, when things go wrong, when people hurt us, it's hard for us to, 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 to calm ourselves and to tell ourselves this is going to work to my good. God's going to bring some good out of this. It's hard to do that at the time because you're feeling the pain of the current situation. It takes a mature saint. I'm telling you, it takes a mature believer to, to be in a situation that's painful where someone has really wronged you or mistreated you or took, taken advantage of you, but you to be in that situation and say, okay, all right, I'm not going to shoot them. Amen. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get on the phone and run their name down. I'm not gonna tell everybody what they did. No, I'm just gonna treat them as if it never happened, because I know somehow, some way, God is gonna bring some good out of this for me. Amen. Romans chapter 8, 28. If you don't know this verse, you need, to, you need to memorize this verse. This verse has gotten me through many years and many situations and circumstances. And we know that in all things, 
God works for the good of those who love him. Anybody love Jesus? Anybody love him from Jesus? Who loves him, who has been called according to his purpose. Listen, if it's one thing I, I, I know, I know I love Jesus. And I know he's called me to do something great for him. Amen, somebody. And when you know that you have a love affair with Jesus, and when you know that God knows you personally, you have to know that, you know what? He's not going to leave me like this. He's not going to let the mess over me like this. He's not going to allow this to stand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't know how he's going to get some glory, but God's going to bring some glory out of this. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. <laughs> you know, back in Genesis, Joseph... His brothers sold him into slavery. First, they really tried to kill him. But because God wouldn't let them kill him, they sold him into slavery. And so now he's over uh, in Egypt, you know, the right-hand man of Pharaoh. And then, you know, there's a famine going on, and his brothers come over, and he's sitting there on the, on the, on the, on the, on the chair, on the throne there, and they come, and they come and get some grain and some food, and Joseph tells him, he said, come closer. He said, I'm Joseph. I'm your brother. The text says, they, and they, he asked him, he said, is, is, is father still alive? Is our dad still, still alive? And the text says, they couldn't even speak. Because they know that he has the power to do unto them what they thought they was going to do to him. Imagine that. You do something wrong to somebody and then you got to come before them and they, they have your life in their hands. And you're thinking, surely, this is it. They're going to do to me what I try to do to them. Joseph said, no. He says this in verse 8, Genesis verse 8, NIV translation. This is a powerful statement. He says, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord over this entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now think about that. He said, it was not you who sent me here. It was God. And he did it now for me to rule over Egypt and to be over everything in Egypt. Then he says this in Genesis 50 verse 20, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Wow, that's powerful. But he says something very key here. He says, it's not you that sent me here. You thought you sent me into slavery. God only used you as an instrument to get me here on the throne. And see, sometimes folks would do stuff to us and we don't understand and we're hurt and we're all messed up. Now realize that maybe God is orchestrating something here. Maybe God is using them to do something. I've been in situations on jobs where I've had a pharaoh on the job and they just mistreated me no matter what I did, no matter what I said, no matter how good my performance was, but I held on to Colossians 3.27. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And that's how I did my job, only to realize that God was working stuff out of me. He was working on my character, working on my attitude because he was going to promote me three years down the road where my character had to be intact. And at the time, I wasn't ready for the promotion. I was praying for the promotion. I wanted the promotion. I coveted the promotion. But God said, if I put you there right now, you're not ready for it. So I'm going to have to bring up some situations. Yeah. Hallelujah. How you not know? Let me put it this way. Maybe, just maybe, the person who wronged you or the person you bumped heads with. Just maybe God is using that 
for something greater for you. Amen, somebody. Do you not know that when God's working on us in the character area, when he's working on us in terms of shaping us and making us better Christians and better children for him, that he will use difficult people, difficult situations and circumstances to send the roughness off for us. Amen, somebody. Because see, when you, before you got saved, you acted a certain way and you would do a certain thing, you would say a certain thing, and you would, would, you would latch out, latch out at it, and you would do certain things. But when you become a believer, and God's going to have you out there as an evangelist, you can't be smacking people. <laughs> you can't be pulling those weeds out and all that. You can't, you can't be a prophet and prophet line. You know what? Here's what the Lord said. You're done. You're through. The Lord's gonna He's gonna wipe you with the floor. Thus says the Lord. Hallelujah. Gotta use people and situations to work stuff out of us to build our character. Amen, somebody. One of the problems that we, we, we have a tendency to have is that we equate forgiveness to reconciliation. And so I don't want to forgive them because I don't want to reconcile to them. See, reconciliation means that you come back into harmony with. So I don't never want to be involved with you again, so I'm not forgiving you. No, forgiveness is different from reconciliation. I can forgive you and not reconcile with you, not come in harmony with you, not be involved in your life again whatsoever. When I forgive you, it doesn't mean that I'm trying to get back into your life, that I'm trying to hang out with you and go to dinner with you. That's not what I'm trying to do. And a lot of times that's what we think that if I forgive this person, that I'm embracing this person back into my life and I'm gonna forget that it ever happened. I'm no, you're never gonna forget. You never forget painful situations. You will always know who hurts you. And you'll always know who you hurt. Amen. I need to throw that in there too. Because just as many people as hurt us, we have hurt others. And oftentimes unaware. <laughs> you know, you think God you're not a pastor? <laughs> no, really, I'm not trying to be funny. Just thank the Lord that you're not holding this mic every Sunday. Month in, month out, year in, year out. I have hurt so many people. I, I don't know nothing about it. But when I find out that I've hurt someone or someone's mad with me, I do my best to try to get that resolved. I do. I do my best to be in right standing with God. Because I don't want nothing messing with the anointing. I don't want nothing messing my blessings. See, God will block my blessings if I don't do right. See, I can't act like some of y'all. I can't. He won't let me get away with some of that stuff. Y'all get away with. Y'all get away with a lot of stuff. He won't let me get away with some of that stuff. So when I know that someone has something against me, I reach out to them. Amen, somebody. I do my best. And this is what you do. You make sure that if someone has something with you, or issue with you, or you have an issue with somebody else, you go to that person. Because you don't want nothing holding up your blessing. You don't want nothing interfering with your anointing, interfering with what God wants to do with you. 
if you act with the main with the same mindset that they're acting on then that's going to hold you there until you grow up and some of us are wondering why god's not using us more why god has not opened certain doors and god is saying these doors are only open for the mature some things are for adults oh please hear that that's not on my notes some things god holds back in the body of christ for adults for mature saints for those who will not do damage to the babes forgiveness is where i release i make a i make a decision it is a decision of my will that i release a person who has wronged me amen i'm not trying to be your friend i'm not trying to reconcile with you i'm not trying to have dinner with you i'm not trying to hang out at your house i'm just releasing you i'm just saying you know what we're good i don't forget what you did i'm just not dealing with you on that basis when you and i come together that's that's done I, now you may forgive uh remember but this as far as i'm concerned that's over amen somebody and then the last thing is this when it comes to forgiveness the Bible makes it very clear that it is God's responsibility to handle any wrong that someone has done towards us. It's God's responsibility. First Peter chapter 3 verse 9, NIV transla uh, translation of the text says, Do not repay evil with evil, or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. He says, don't, don't repay evil with evil. Now watch what Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through verse 21 says, NIV translation. Verse 17, it, the text says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. I like that, in the eyes of everybody. Not just God, but everybody. It, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take vengeance, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will reap burning coals on his head. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Man, that's a, that's, what this verse is saying in essence is that it is God's responsibility, his role, to handle anyone who has done anything towards you as his child. Amen, somebody. When I was growing up, I was youngest of six, and uh, as bad as I was, it was some folks in my house I could not whoop. I'm talking about my siblings. They were, they beat me, no, I, you know, some, some folks I couldn't handle. But the only one I could handle was maybe Beanie. Couldn't handle JoJo, she'd beat you down, leave you bleeding. You want some more? Little bitty thing. She beat you to a pulp, man. Laugh at you. Kick you, walk out the door. And so, because I couldn't handle in terms of taking care of my siblings, I told my mother. And when I told my mother, she handled it. She get the belt. She deal with them she would always handle that situation. Sometimes they get a belt, sometimes they get fussed at, but she would ne never let it go because it was her job to dish out the discipline. And so when I was growing up and I want to get my, I'm telling mama. I'm telling mama. Mama. I'm telling mama. I'm telling, and then when you get in front of mom, I'm crying and snotting at, at, as if they killed me. And all they said was, no, you can't go with them. <laughs> well, I'm acting like they don't kill me, you know, because I knew mom was going to dish out the wrath. 
This is what this text is saying. This text is saying you don't have to say nothing to anybody. You don't have to get revenge with anybody. All you have to do is sit back and let your father handle it. When you and I try to deal with people who have wronged us, when we try to take that situation into our own hands, what we're doing is we're trying to take the role of the father. Those are some big shoes. We are not to take on the responsibility of God. You let God be God. Amen, somebody. And then it says this, if there is no peace in the relationship, make sure you're not the one causing it not to be peace. If there's no peace in the marriage, if there's no peace if it's your siblings, if there's no peace on the job, if there's no peace in the family reunion, you make sure that you're not the source of the problem. Don't be sitting there with a cross around your neck causing all types of hell. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> send us all this, everybody else, they send us stepping over you. you No, no. God is looking at that and saying, you know what? That is not right. How many know that's not right? It's not right. I mean, we're going to represent him. Let's represent him correctly. Amen, somebody. He says in verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. Translation, what he's saying here in essence is, do not enter the demonic realm trying to get folks back. See, when you try to get folks back, you have opened the door for the enemy to use you as an instrument of demonic activity. If you're going to be anointed, let it be the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Don't walk around with Satan's anointing. Don't walk around with the king's spirit. Don't do that. Pastor Dick, I didn't know. You know now. You know now. If they mess over you, they mistreat you, okay. God, so are you. I don't like it. It don't feel good. But I'm mature enough to stay back and leave it alone. That's the question. Are you mature enough in your walk with God and as a Christian in terms of knowing who you are in Christ Jesus to take your hands off of it? Come on, give him a praise. So here it is. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, as we really bring this to a close. How then do we release people? It, it just, I'm just curious. Let me see the hands of those of you who would say, you know what? I bumped heads with someone within the last six months. My God, that's the whole church. Some folks put up their foot in their hand, both hands. <laughs> Jesus. You know why that is? Because it's common to life. It's normal. When you come and you interact with other people with different opinions, different backgrounds, different personalities, different desires, different understandings, different educations, you're going to bump heads. I'm not going to ask. I mean, I'm still bumping heads. I'm not going to, because after the day, that's going to, that's, that's going to cease. I thought they was going to shout me down. <laughs> they just looked at me like, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right, Lord. 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. I'm going to let you go home. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Jesus makes it very clear. He says, if someone has done something to you that you feel has been an offense, don't just pretend like it didn't happen. Don't go tell other people that it happened. He says, you go to that person that you feel that has wronged you by yourself and explain to them how you feel in terms of what took place in that situation. Sometimes people don't know. I promise you, the two individuals I'm dealing with right now, well, one of them, one I do know, but the other one, I don't know. I have no clue. I just, I probably should, but I don't. I'm trying to understand. I want to understand, but I can't understand if you don't give me the opportunity to understand. Sometimes you have to give people the opportunity to understand what they did wrong. And in most cases, people be like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Yeah. Or if I hurt you, I apologize. In most cases, people are pretty, pretty good at that. That's why Jesus says, if it happens, whether it's in your household, whether it's with your children, whether it's with the supervisor, whether it's in the church, the neighbor, this doesn't matter. He says, go to them by yourself and explain to them how you feel. So the first thing he says, go to them in person. Now, I'm going to add on to that. Is that okay? Because that was back when Jesus walked the earth. That's about all you could do but go to them. Amen, somebody. All right. Now, I'm going to add to this. Now, if you, you, know, you don't have to receive this. This is Doug Thompson 101. You can trash this if you want to. I don't have scripture and verse for this. But I'm just going to, you know, bring it up to 21, 21st century. Jesus says, go to them in person. That's the first thing you do. I'm saying if that don't work, call them. Amen. I wanted to go in person, but I don't know who they are now. So I'll call. Call in person. If that don't work, send an email. Send a text. If that don't work, send a certified letter. No, you laugh and I'm telling you. What you want to do is be right in the eyes of God. You want God to know, you know what? God, I've done everything I possibly could to resolve this. I'm not responsible for how they respond to me. See, that's, that's the thing. You're not responsible for how people respond to you. You're only responsible for trying to get it right. And on your part, you're going to say, you know what? If there's any turbulence, if there's any hell going on out there, it's not on my side. Me and Jesus is good. And so when I lay down at night and eat my popcorn, I'm good. I got a clear conscience. Come on, Holy Ghost, you want some more popcorn? <laughs> but see, I can't lay down, eat popcorn, and act like, you know, and I've been treating folks like. <sighs> and I'm all around talking about I'm a pastor. That's no different than you. You walk around talking about you're God's child. God ain't in the titles. He's in the hearts. <laughs> and I want to make sure my heart is right before God in everything I do. As much as I have knowledge of. And so, you know, if you can't go to them, call them. If you can't call them, write them, email, text them. Now, if that don't work, they could be, you know, they could have passed. Do it through prayer. Release them through prayer. Some of you this morning have been wronged by people who are no longer walking the earth. 
a father, a mother, a aunt, a cousin, a somebody who has done something to you, you have kept it closed for all these years, you've kept it quiet. Let me just touch on this just a little. I'm just going to tap this just the middle, just a little, and I'm going to pull back on it. Some of you have been molested. Some of you have been abused. Some of you have been treated terribly by people who are no longer around. Release them through prayer. Don't hold on to that, that pain. It was awful, it was terrible, it hurt, yes, but you want to be free of it. And the only way to be free of it is to say, you know what? God, I released them from payment. I no longer want them to suffer. I no longer want them to feel the way I feel. I'm done with it. And sometimes you have to do it by faith. Sometimes you have to verbalize it and do it by faith. And when you do it by faith, God will give you the grace to be able to receive the healing that you need. Some of you are really hurting this morning. I know it because I can feel it. I can feel it. And I'm telling you this morning, you're not responsible, nor can you control other people's actions. The only thing you can do is to forgive them, release them, and allow the Lord to heal you of any hurt and pain. And I promise you, if you, if you take that step of faith, God will heal you. He'll make you whole. He'll remove that pain and it hurt. Don't ever let the enemy tell you that people don't deserve to be forgiven. <laughs> the only reason we're Christians is because of the principle of forgiveness. whole Christian story is based on the premise of forgiveness. As if God can give it to us, we can give it to others. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. Father, we just thank you for just reminding us, Father, how to be free from any past pains and hurts. Father, we recognize this morning that this is not an easy subject. It's not something that we take lightly. We recognize, Father, that it's something that we are to do and we are to embrace. But Father, we recognize that for some it, it's a challenge, it's, it's difficult. Father, it's our prayer this morning that you would give all of us the inner strength and the grace to be able to forgive anyone who have harmed us. And also give us, Father, the understanding and the wisdom to know those that we have hurt. That we might ask for forgiveness. And Father, we thank you that as we embrace your instructions on forgiveness 
to all of us everyone who hears this message father will be made whole spirit soul and body and we thank you for this in Jesus name amen come on let's give him a love offering hallelujah if you're here this morning or if you're watching by way of media and you don't have a relationship with Jesus you have never invited the Lord Jesus into your life into your heart that's really where you want to start when it comes to forgiveness when it comes to being healed you want Christ in your life you want to make sure that you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ so if you're watching this morning or if you're present and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior but you say this morning you say pastor I I want Christ in my life I want to become a Christian I want to be saved if that's you this morning I'm gonna lead you into a very simple prayer and I'm gonna ask you to repeat after me but I promise that if you repeat this prayer and believe it in your heart your life will change forever and for the better I'm gonna ask everyone present to repeat after me say Heavenly Father I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died but on the third day he was raised from the dead and he's now seated at your right hand praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly father I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my life to come into my heart and to be my personal Lord and Savior now father by faith I believe that I'm saved that I'm born again and I thank you for it in Jesus name I pray amen amen now listen, if you pray that prayer for the first time by way of media, there's some information on the screen. We would ask that you would contact us. Let us know. We want to celebrate with you. Amen. Well, come on, give God a God bless you. Isn't he good? Amen. Well, are you ready to worship the Lord in your giving? Amen. I'm going to have uh, Minister Parrish come as we get ready to worship the Lord in our giving. What is uh, offering time? Time to uh, worship our Lord and Savior in our giving. And uh, I can recall as a, a little boy when I would uh, go out and help my uh, granddad uh, do different types of tasks, um, cutting grass or cleaning bricks, he would pay me. And my mom wanted me to uh, give money to the church. And that was not a concept I could uh, I could grasp. And uh, I would often uh, show my emotions uh, via tears or a lot of questions, amen. Um, but giving to God is a, a, a form of uh, worship, a form of gratitude. And uh, this, it's been an interesting year. It's been an interesting uh, few years, amen. And uh, Pastor Doug said a couple of things when he first got up into the pulpit this morning that jumped out at me. He said, uh, he said, first, first he said, aren't you glad to be a Christian? Amen. And then he said something about, uh, be, aren't you thankful that there are no bombs dropping on your head? Amen. And uh, I'm going to take a different course uh, with the offering this morning. Uh, an old military buddy of mine, is uh, he, he works at a church. He lives in the Midwest. And they have a Bible study every Sunday evening. And I've been a part of it uh, recently. Um, last about an hour, you can go through uh, some scriptures and whatnot. And toward the end, you know, people 
um, share what they learned or just testimonies or whatever. Um, and my buddy he's married to, uh, he's been married a few years, I think in 2016, he married a young lady from uh, Ukraine. And uh, at the end, he, he touched on what they've been talking about, uh, with the, what's going on over in Ukraine. And then uh, she got on the phone and she said something pretty interesting. She's uh, She came to America when she was 20, but she grew up in Ukraine around. When she was five years old, she used to go to church. And uh, she said, uh, at, uh, the KGB will often break into their services and arrest who was ever preaching, a deacon, or whoever is leading, and take them away, put them in jail. And uh, what they would do, um, they have to plan and plot and have a service in secret. And even with that, they had to be careful about who they told because the KGB would infiltrate the services and then find out where they are and then come do it again. And she had to make a decision at a very young age about being a Christian. Her, her parents shared with her what it was about and she saw with her own eyes what it was about. It was a, literally a life or death situation. Amen. And now uh, she has a daughter. Daughter, I think, is around 13 years old. And she shared with her this whole walk uh, of being a Christian. And, but she had a different perspective. You and I may take Christianity for granted. We, you know, uh, I shouldn't say you and I. Some of us um, um, are half in, half out. Uh, we don't. We. Uh, it's hard for some to tell that we have been Christians, but th for them, this is real. <laughs> And she had to know, if I'm ever caught by the KGB, I got to say, yay or nay, are you a Christian? And she made up her mind at a very young age that, uh, uh, like Joseph said, uh, you know, uh, in my house, we're going to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. So I say all that to you. Uh, I look at what's going on in Ukraine. And uh, before this thing even kicked off, they said, this, this is, uh, Russia's going to wipe them off the map. It's, uh, it's a David versus a Goliath type situation. But I believe uh, the, the prayers of a righteous avail of much. And the reason they're able to do what they're doing is because of prayers of the saints. So we should be thankful, amen? And we should show our gratitude and worship God in our giving, amen? Amen. The ushers is coming forth. Amen. Everybody's giving who wants to give. They can't tell you it's on the job. You done? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. If you would, please stretch your hand toward the offering bucket. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that went forth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plan, financial plan for believers called tithes and offering. Dear God, we thank you for every person who desired to give, who's given, dear God. I pray and ask that you bless the giver, bless the receiver, dear God. Bless and multiply, dear God. I pray that each and every person that gave, I pray that you meet them at that point of need, that they lack no good thing in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank you that because of their obedience to your word, that we as however serene are able to do all that you've called us to do dear god touching lives changing lives saving souls heavenly father we thank you and we bless bless you in your holy name amen